welcome back once more to max easy lessons if you're new to my channel thank you for stopping in i hope you will feel free to hit that red button and keep your bell notifications on so you will see the rest of the killer mockingbird series here if you're returning to my channel continue to keep the bell button on thank you all so much for being here um let's get straight into this it's going to be a lengthy one yes but i do hope that you will enjoy it and you will learn something from it so Talking about the history and the historical setting is important. In order to understand To Kill a Mockingbird, you have to understand where Harper Lee is coming from with the storyline. Now, To Kill a Mockingbird is set in Macomb, Alabama in the United States, and that happened between 1933 to 1935, at a time when America was still experiencing the effects of the Great Depression, which was brought on by the stock market crash of 1929. The American South was practically in bankruptcy, and this was not just for colored people, but it was also impacting white people as well. These people were living with high un unemployment rates, and they were impoverished in so many ways. Now, Harper Lee uses her narrator, Scout, to tell the story of Maycomb as a tired old town, definitely tired, and uh, she also emphasizes here the effects of poverty in Maycomb, where we see Atticus, for one, who is one of the main characters, we see Atticus being paid in farming produce for the legal services that he gives to poor families, including the Cunninghams. Now, all of this storyline comes from slavery, the legacy of slavery, in fact. Now, slavery, yes, it was banned and the colored folks were actually free, but they were still living at a time where white people still held them in the minority groups in, in very, 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 very strong terms. Now, America was divided on the issue of slavery after the Civil War experience in the late 1800s. We found that the whites of the southern areas, they saw the Af African Americans as being beneath them, as subordinates. And so they tended to ostracize the colored people or the blacks, the African Americans who lived there at the time. Now, in this novel, we see several instances where this happens. The readers, of course, will see that the colored people had to sit in separate sections in the courtroom during Tom Robinson's trial. Now, we can also point out as well that the coloreds were not fairly represented in the educational system as well. Calpurnia, who happens to be the Finch's housekeeper, she expressed that she was the only one out of the four of her brothers and sisters who could read in her family. So what we get there is that the colors were not encouraged to be educated, and it was very rare, even after slavery, it was very rare for the blacks to be able to read or write. Now the whites continued to dominate the legal system. And that is clear in the trial of Tom Robinson, where the jury was totally white. So, of course, a black man facing a totally white jury at a time where segregation was rampant, you do know what that outcome would have been. No, members of the white population who were connected to the colored folks, these people were also treated as aliens. They were alienated. They were separated. People never liked them much because... They were in favor of the colored people and they saw the colored people as basically humans or their equals. Now, the novel gives reference to Dolphus Raymond, the white man who married a colored woman, and also to Atticus Finch, who is the white lawyer who defends the colored man. In a similar way, similarly, the colored people, they kept to themselves. Of course, they would have kept to themselves, yes, because this is what society expected them to do. And so they lived up to that expectation of the society. Now, when Scout visits Calpurnia's church, when she goes to Calpurnia's church, remember now, Scout is that little white girl whose father is Atticus Finch. Calpurnia is the black housekeeper. Now, when Scout goes to Calpurnia's church, she was not altogether accepted. One church member, Lula, made it clear that she did not accept her. Now, to make matters worse, lynching. That was that um, inhumane treatment that was meted out to black people in some cases. Now, lynching was also part of the life of the African-American South. The people who created these lynch mobs, they often entertained and engaged in hate crimes against the colored in the society. Tom Robinson. Tom Robinson is that character who faced the ideals of lynching at the time. Now, he was in prison long before his trial. 
A group of people who we would refer here to as the lynch mob came for him. And when they came for him, right then and there, we knew that they would be taking the laws into their own hands. This means, though, that they would be planning on killing him, getting rid of him, because that was what was expected then. No, Harper Lee uses different techniques in the novel, and one such technique is that of flashback. No, when we talk about the flashback technique being used here, we're talking about the story being told through the eyes of a six-year-old narrator, Scott Finch. And it is, yes, related to the first-person narrator, but she is grown. And she goes back in time to different periods of her life while she was telling that story. We see the older and more experienced Scott Finch. Yes, she is the one who gives us her childhood memories throughout the story. And she gives us the events surrounding Tom Robinson. She gives us, and that would have been the racial injustice. She gives us the social injustice of the way that Boo Radley was treated, of the way the Cunninghams were treated, and the way, on a whole, the society looked at the UL's too. Now, in chapter one, Scott tells us that when enough years had gone by, to help us to look back on them, we sometimes discuss the, lead, the events leading to the accident. Now, Scott's, Scott's view as a child narrator is one of innocence, and in many cases, amusing. But as the novel continues, we realize that Scott becomes older and her thoughts are more mature. And so she becomes more accepting of the people around her, largely because of the values that her father teaches her. At the end of the book, Scout acknowledges her father's advice about Boo Radley when she says, you never know a man until you stand in his shoes and walk around in them. Now, this was supposed to be an indication that Scout could understand the trials and tribulations of other people because she wanted to be in their position. She put herself in that position where she could actually understand what was happening. In the story, there are conflicts and there are many conflicts there. There are a group conflicts with a middle-class man, Atticus Finch, who is trying to defend the colored man, Tom Robinson, in a city that was dominated by whites. And at a time, that was not accepted. Tom Robinson is accused of raping a white woman called Mayella Ewell. And Mr. Finch, although he is admired by the wider society, the wider community, there were challenges for people who wanted to accept what he was doing as the right thing and knowing that their society would not have allowed that to happen. And so they refer to him as the end lover by Bob Ewell, who represents the voice of the working class whites. Now, we also see one of the techniques that Harper Lee uses is that of symbols. The symbol of the mockingbird is common and controls most of what we see happening in the novel. Tom Robinson is a mockingbird. Boo Radley is a mockingbird as well because they are innocent and the mockingbird is quite innocent, but yet people will take advantage of them. And that was what happened to Tom Robinson and Boo Radley. These characters, yes, they are innocent and they are accused falsely and the society distanced themselves from them. Boo Radley is definitely not understood by the community. And of course, we know that Tom Robinson is put into isolation. He's alienated from the rest of the society because of his color. Now, let's jump into the characters. And there is also another video there that will handle the whole episodes of all the characters that are in the novel. But this one will just focus on a few. Now, in the novel, Atticus Finch is, presents the story from a moralist point of view. His bravery is inspiring to everybody around him and his family. He motivates his kids with his actions. He, in other words, practices what he preaches to them. And so his children look up to him. They respect him. They have the greatest respect for him, just as the rest of the community members. Of course, for his kids, we do not see it right away. But in the interim, we understand that his kids also respect him for who he is. His efforts at being brave and at being an outstanding man are reinforced by his daughter, Scott Finch. Her innocence and her curiosity helps to shape the plot and the events that takes place. Now, in contrast though, aside from the fact that he is brave and he's an outstanding citizen who understands and appreciates everyone, he is challenged by Bob Ewell. Now, Bob Ewell is a part of that closed society that cannot accept people because of their races and their social class. Now, Bob Ewell really and truly is in no position to determine who accepts who in the society, yes. And that's the irony of it from my perspective. But what we find is that Bob Ewell, 
he is a part of that closed society of Malcolm who cannot accept Tom Robinson as a black man or as their equal. Now, what we find out, though, is that Tom Robinson and Boo Radley both serve as victims and heroes who the society chastise. But at the same time, they are caring and they are devoted and they are there to help others. Jean-Louise Finch is a scout. Now, at the start of the novel, we see Jean, Jean uh, let me go with Scout. We see Scout as a naive and feisty girl. She gets into trouble. She is not afraid to fight with anybody. She is expressive. She is intelligent and she is definitely aggressive. We see where she beats Walter Cunningham. Scout does not understand the racial issues that exist in the community. And she doesn't see that until she goes to that trial of Tom Robinson. Her aggression is demonstrated when Cecil Jacobs and cousin Francis makes negative remarks about her father for defending Tom Robinson, and of course she goes off. The brawls provide a quick solution to her problems that she has, and additionally, her expressive side comes out in her class when her teacher, Mrs. Fisher, decides to give Walter Cunningham money and expects to get it back in return. Scout right here shows that, look, I'm going to tell you as it is, and it doesn't matter if you understand or not. So some people would say that Scout had no tact as such, but it's not that she didn't have tact. It's the fact that Scout wanted to make everybody aware and to see everything as they really are. And so she has no qualms about pointing out to that teacher, the social background of Walter Cunningham. And this gets her into trouble because her teacher is closed minded, a part of the closed group and doesn't understand the social injustice that can be meted out to people who are just the same color as you are as well. Now, despite this, Scout is seen as a hero when she stops the lynch mob from killing Tom Robinson. How does she do that? How does she do this? She innocently appealed to Mr. Cunningham's humanity. In the end, though, Scout learns to accept people for who they are in several lessons that involve Tom Robinson, Walter Cunningham, Boo Radley, and Atticus. Now, we're going quickly into Atticus Finch. And again, I said there is a more detailed character video that will be linked to this one. So you can check it out for the rest of the characters. Atticus Finch is respectable in his community. He's a lawyer. Everyone admires him. Right before Tom Robinson's case, yes. They admire him for his justice and his fairness, his forgiving nature, his compassion, his com courage, sorry, his morality. He is a good parent. He spends time with his children. He teaches them what it is that they need to accept about people and not to be caught up in what society expects of them, but to be their own individuals and to make their own judgments. Tom Robinson is presented as a strong family man. We see that he can be compassionate and innocent. Now, all of this gets him into trouble because he, Mayela Ewell, takes advantage of him because he was kind to her, and she and her father falsely accused him for a crime of rape that he did not do. Tom's fate is sealed by the racial conflict between the whites and the blacks in the American South. He doesn't get a fair trial, and because he won't get a fair trial as a black man, we find that he is destined to a guilty verdict, and of course, his inevitable death. Boo Radley, I'll repeat for you, is the mockingbird of the novel. Boo Radley is presented as a quiet hero who is kind and protective, and his instincts allows him to be protective of others and kind towards others. And we see that throughout the novel, where he is kind to Jim, Scout, and Dill. He faces stigmatism because of the society's expectations, the social order at the time. He is locked away. He's a recluse. He's a man of mystery to many people because they don't see him. They don't know anything about him. Now, in Maycomb community, we find that his presence is felt in the lives of the kids because the children, because he does things for them throughout the novel. And it is through them that we truly understand who Boo Radley is. Bob Ewell is of importance. He's the antagonist of the story. And unlike the other fathers that are presented in the novel, we realize that Bob Ewell, he neglects his children at the highest level. He abuses his daughter. He spends his money on alcohol. And he is a bitter man who preaches the wrong values to his children. He represents the white human trash of Macon, as they are called. And he is so vengeful that he does not stop 
when he tries to incriminate Tom Robinson for a crime he does not do. And when he realizes that he's not successful to the great extent he wanted to, he takes his revenge on the Finch's family for supporting Tom Robinson in the first place. No, his cruel actions, those are the things that led to his doom and his death. Now, quickly, just a point of note, that there are several groups that existed in the novel, and these groups are discriminated against. Now, when we talk about the discrimination against groups, we're talking about the stereotypes. The UL's, for example, even though they are white, they are considered to be the white trash of the society, and so they fall into a particular category of being at the bottom of the social order. But beneath those white trash, we would find the black outcast, who would be Tom Robinson and the Negroes as a whole. The Cunningham represent the Cunninghams, they represent the poor whites. Now they are not as low as the white trash, and they are definitely not in line with the blacks. They are a little bit above the white trash trash, but definitely way above the black old caste. Now that's another group that is stereotyped against. The Radleys are independent and mysterious, and they form their own group. Nobody knows much about them, and so we know that Boo Radley is a recluse, and nobody else knows what goes on in their house. Miss Caroline and Miss DeBose, DeBose, and the ladies at the tea party, they represent the aristocrat, the accepted white people in the society. Now, again, we also find that there is another group of independent thinkers, and these would include Atticus Finch, Link Dias, Dolphus Raymond, Mr. Hectate, Mr. Underwood, Calpurnia, and Miss Marty. So basically, in that one novel, we have so many groups of people who are different in the society and who the society hold in different regards. Let's continue. In terms of point of view and the experiences learned, we can look at the narrative voice first, and then we're going to look at the experiences that Scott learns. No, in terms of the narrative voice, we realize that it's told from a first person point of view. We see Scout as that first person. This is beneficial in many ways as we get a first-hand experience of what is happening based on the experiences of the character who is telling that story. It also adds some amount of realism to the story as you read along. No, the narrative voice is that of Scout. She is the protagonist. She is the narrator. Scout tells the story from an adult perspective, and so, of course, we realize that it's a flashback technique being used, and she is reflecting on her childhood. When the story is told, though, we get to appreciate Scout's innocent perspective that is combined with the adult's exploration of her childhood experiences. Now, what that means is that she remembers... She saw the events as a child, but as an adult, she can put certain things into perspective and get a better view of what it was that she experienced at the time. No, in keeping with the child's perspective, Scott has no knowledge of social and racial prejudices or fears and inhibitions. This means that as a child, she knows that something is wrong with people because of their color, but does she truly understand it as a child? No. Now, the conflicts she has are a result of coming to terms with the racial and social tensions that existed in the society at the time. Cousin Frances tells her that her father loves the black race. And so in that derogatory term, he refers to him as the nigger lover. She punches him in the face because she doesn't really understand the situation. It's not that Cousin Francis was wrong, but I believe that Scott thought that what he had said and how he had said it was what came off as being wrong. Now, later, when she asks Atticus to explain the term, we find that the Scout's innocence translates into humor in many cases in these times because Atticus tells her as it is. In her attempts to analyze Jem in chapter 12, we also realize that there is some amount of humor. She says that Jem was 12 and that he was, his appetite was appalling. And he told me so many times to stop, stop pestering him. And then she goes on to say, I consulted Atticus because she believes he had the tapeworm. So she is trying to explain to the readers that Jem, her brother, was going through puberty at the time. And so he was a bit conflicting in whatever he was doing. But she didn't understand the whole ideals of puberty. And so she believed that he had the tapeworm instead. Now, the child's viewpoint will also bring some amount of suspense to the story. Through Scout's narration, 
we see that Boo Radley is a mystery. As a child, she doesn't truly understand him, and so he is a mystery to her. But he places a blanket over her, and nobody else realizes this. This shows that she is confused in many ways, and she is also frightened. Scout's viewpoint changes from that of a child to that of an adult towards the end of the novel. And we realize that in coming to terms as a grown-up, she now can accept people for who they are. And she just thinks that there are only one type of people in the world. There is only one type of people in the world, and that's people. She doesn't see them through their colors or their class or whatever it is. She just sees everybody as people. And that would in itself have had to be a matured thought. Scott's perspective is really not exclusive, as Harper Lee allows the reader to get an insight into the other character's points of view based on the simple narration that Scott gives. For example, when we're talking about Tom Robinson's murder, Scott captures the more serious reactions of the other characters, and she says, Atticus leaned against the refrigerator, puts his pushed his glasses up and rubbed his eyes. And then she talks about Calpurnia, and she says, Calpurnia fumbled at her apron, Miss Molly went to Calpurnia and untied it. Aunt Alexandra sat down on Calpurnia's chair and put her hands on her face. Now for Scott as a child, she doesn't really understand what is happening. But as an adult reader, it would have been, or as an older reader then, it would have been easy to understand that something had gone wrong and these people were worried. Now let's go into the experiences that Scott learns. And I'm trying to go as quickly as I can so that the, this video is not too long. Scott Finch goes through a process of growth in the novel as she looks for answers to go to the troubling questions about the differences between humanity and the level of cruelty that humanity projects towards each other. Now, this makes the novel something different. There is that naive confrontational main character who becomes tolerant and who becomes mature in her thoughts. And all of this happens because of the lessons she learns in her life along the, way, on, along the way. Now, some of the lessons that Scott learn. She learns to respect others despite their social class or race. She learns not to be judgmental. She becomes aware that her brother Jim is growing up and that he needs to have his space as well. Scott learns about courage. She learns also that people are not always who they seem to be. And through all of what happens around her, she learns to avoid physical battles and to fight with her good sense and rational instead of her anger. Now, the issues and themes in the novel. Harper Lee presents the story of a community that is divided by social prejudice, by racial prejudice. Boo Radley and Tom Robinson are the primary people who are the victims of the prejudice that exists in the society. Tom is wrongfully accused of raping a white woman, and Boo Radley has been forced to become a hermit, a recluse, and a figure that carries a lot of super, supernatural um, stories. A courageous lawyer, Atticus, attempts to defend Tom in a courtroom with a jury that cannot separate justice from his personal feelings of prejudices. Now, in all of this conflict and violence, Atticus tries to give his children a stable family life. He tries to build their morals and he tries to teach them to accept individuals for who they are. He attempts and he, I believe he makes a good job of creating a good psychological growth that leads them from their innocent stage to becoming more matured adults. No, racial, religious and social is one of the themes that occurs there. Harper Lee uses different actions and words of the characters to show the level of segregation and discrimination that existed in the novel. Atticus, we see, is treated differently by members of his family and also by the wider society because of his relationship with the African-Americans, including Calpurnia and Tom Robinson. Bob Ewell, yes, Bob Ewell, the troubling character, the antagonist in the story, he spits on Atticus's face after the trial. And Alexandra, who is Atticus's sister, is unhappy because she sees where the children are being raised by a colored woman. So she is prejudiced and she's a family of Atticus, which tells us a lot of things, a lot of things about that family. The social prejudice is there as well in the different class structures that existed in Maycomb. There is Dolphus Raymond, there is the Cunninghams, there is the Radley family, 
and these make up the lower middle class. Then you have the UELs who are referred to as the white trash who live in the dumps and are dependent on welfare. You also have Dolphus Raymond who is Caucasian and the society condemns him in many ways because he goes and marries an African-American woman. Then there is Miss Walter, Miss Scott, Miss Caroline. Oh, there is Miss Caroline. She did not understand why Walter Cunningham would not accept charity to purchase lunch. What she didn't know was that despite the fact that the Cunninghams were poor, they were a proud people and they did not accept charity that easily. Religious prejudice is also a part of the novel as well. So we see the social prejudice, we see racial prejudice, and now we are seeing religious prejudice. It is a part of the novel and an important part of the novel because we recognize that the Caucasians and African Americans worship differently. There is that division that is there. Calpurnia takes a scout and gem to church and Lulu says, you ain't got no business bringing white children here. They got their own church. Now right away when she says they have their own church, it goes to show that even through a religious perspective, this society was quite divided. Violence is another theme. Racial conflict creates that kind of hostility in the small town as Atticus and his family face abuse by the rest of the society. The lynch mobs are there and they try to take the law into their own hands. We also see Bob Ewell attempting to take the lives of Jem and Scout. Now this is a social, is a racial war. And what was troubling about that particular scene was that Bob Ewell, because he was so blinded by his racial prejudice, he was willing to attack children. But it was Boo Radley who came to their rescue. The social, the social recluse, the one who's, who the society was prejudiced against, he was the one who came. No, Tom Robinson is shot 17 times for trying to supposedly escape from prison. No, that violence is a lot to handle from a child's perspective. And so we tended to see the innocent perception that Scott has. But all of this, though, is what changed her into a matured adult. Justice in the novel is there. Atticus Finch struggles because he wants justice for Tom Robinson in a tone that is filled with ignorant people. People who are ignorant to the fact that humans are humans and should be treated likewise. Now, despite presenting enough reasons for the jury to prove, to prove that Tom is innocent, Tom was licked before it even began. In other words, Tom's case was tried long before he even went to court. He was found guilty long before he went to court. And so it was no surprise because the people allowed their prejudices to interfere with the justice system. It is ironic that Bob Ewell did receive justice too at the end of the novel because he dies by the knife that he wanted to use to attack Scott and Jim. We also see that Boo Radley is a victim of the injustice in the society. At the end of the novel, he doesn't really get any justice, but we realize that the injustice there was common in his life because he was locked up by his father for a minor crime. Now, luckily, he was not charged for killing Bob Ewell, and uh, he was saved by those who were able to understand him or to walk in their shoes, in his shoes. The loss of innocence is next. The child's perspective is used to highlight many sensitive issues. We see Scout, Jem, and Dill. They playfully harass the Radleys because they're innocent. And so it is a part of them to have a game towards Boo Radley because no one knows who he is or what he's about. Scout insults Walter Cunningham because he lacks social grace. And this is where she is innocent because she doesn't understand that because they are so poor, they would not understand what it was to be in a position to, pro to, to, to profess social graces. Scout is also unaware of the true intentions of the lynch mob as she engages in a casual conversation with them. However, her innocence later becomes an experience when she goes to Tom Robinson's trial. Scout gets in a fight with children at school because she does not understand what it means to be prejudiced. Atticus does not teach them to be prejudiced. He teaches them to love everybody irrespective of their colors. And so it was very hard for Scout to understand the whole ideals of prejudice. And so because she doesn't understand it, she fights her way out of it. Jem's optimism also is shattered by Reverend Skies, who tells him, I ain't ever seen any jury decide in favor of the colored man over a white man. So right away, we understand that 
Scott and Jem, who had not been taught to be prejudiced against anybody, had to face the reality that this black man, he was found guilty long before his trial had happened. At the end of the trial, Atticus helps the children to realize and to accept that this is how their life is. He notes that Atticus says that they've done it before and they did it tonight. And of course, they will do it again. And when they do, it seems that only the children would have been affected. Family life is next. Harper Lee uses the Finch's family to show the model family. In many ways, the Finch's family represented the model family. And if it's, I'm talking about the Finch's family as an extended unit, we see that Aunt Alexandra is prejudiced, but Atticus is not. And his kids are there. And while he loves his sister, he does not allow her to influence the moral values that he is teaching his children. Atticus is a single parent, yes. He is intelligent, he is fair-minded, he is sensitive. And as such, he can be seen as a perfect father. We see his parenting skills when he says to Uncle Jack, when a child asks you something, answer him, but don't make a production of it. Atticus further notes that children are children, but they can spot an invasion quicker than adults. In this case, Atticus raises the children with the help of Calpurnia, and Calpurnia serves as the mother figure. Now, Tom Robinson, he also has a family and a stable family life as well. The only difference between Atticus's stability in his family and Tom Robinson's stability in his family would have been their color. But at the same time, both men were honest and respectable. And so both families would have been presented as the ideal family, irrespective of their races. Their races. No, they were different from the Cunninghams. They were also different from the Ewells, the Ratliffs, and their parents. And those are the ones who were presented as dysfunctional in the society. So the two model families came from opposing racial divides. And what Harper Lee tries to do there is to show the readers that your family, the values you teach your family, these are not dependent on the color of your skin. And she also goes to show that the society, which was prejudiced against the black person, in the society at the time were the dysfunctional ones. Mr. Ewell leaves his eldest daughter to manage the family and the Cunninghams, of course, they segregate themselves from the society. The Radleys, again, also live in isolation. And so even though they were whites and they were supposedly better than the blacks in the society at the time, guess what? Those were dysfunctional families. And Harper Lee successfully shows the contrast between families and also shows that the family that would have been regarded as of the lower echelon in the society, the lower status in the society, also proved to be a functional family just as a white man's family. And so it was inevitable. And it was important for us too to understand that the Robinson's family and the Finch's family were similar in many ways, despite the fact that the society would have separated these individuals and would not have seen the good in the black family because of their color. Now, let's go into moral development. We realize that Atticus teaches his children moral values, to accept people for who they are. Jem learns that Boo is kind because he places the gifts in the tree. He also learns about the good and the evil in society when he goes to Tom Robinson's trial. Scout also realizes the need to practice restraint and not be as, as hostile as she would have been. She also learns to be tolerant of others. As her father says, you never understand a person until you climb in his skin and walk around in it. And finally, for the issues and themes, we will look at the supernatural. There are many superstitions that surrounds Boo Radley. Um, people make stories about him throughout the novel, throughout time, even before the novel was created. And this makes him interesting and it gives the novel a surprising twist because at the onset we thought that Boo Radley was a bad person but at the end of it it is Boo Radley who turns around and saves the children from their dilemma. Moving on, stay with atmosphere, style and language. Let's go into the mood and the atmosphere. Okay, um, yes the mood and the atmosphere. As you read the novel you will see that there is a general mood at the onset. There is one of mystery. There is one of interest. There is one of suspense, tension, and there is one of gloom. Throughout the novel, those come about. Not at the onset. At the onset, sorry, there is mystery, interest, 
In the middle of the novel, there comes suspense, tension, and at the end of the novel, there comes glue. So what we find is that the atmosphere and the mood shifts according to the events as they unfold. The use of language. In the novel, in the book, you realize that there is dialect, and that is representative of the American South. Calpurnia uses this, uses this term, where you out, and when she talks about where you out, she's referring to a spanking. Jem speaks about Recon to show what he's thinking, and Atticus uses the phrase you all to, re to refer to several people. Now, language is one of the things that define the social class of people. The poorer set would speak one language. The blacks speak one another language. Um, the upper class speaks an educated language. And so the rich, we would say then, has a more elegant language control than the white trash. No, Bob Ewell's language, definitely. That black yonder rotting on my, my yellow, that in itself tells you that he is highly uneducated in many ways and that he is just a social misfit. The reader also discovers that the African-Americans hold on to their distinct dialect in their environment. When they are amongst each other, they switch to their dialect. Scout asks Calpurnia why she does not use proper language in her church, and she replies, you, you're not going to change any of them by talking right. They've got to want to learn themselves, and when they don't want to learn, there's nothing you can do but keep your mouth shut or talk their language. And I think we can all relate to that because when you are amongst your peers and your social groups, you have to remember that if you try to speak in a standard language, in many cases, you will find that you are shunned by the rest of the group. Now, despite the exploration of serious issues in the novel, we find humor as well, and the humor appeals to the readers. Scott tells her cousin Francis, Talking to Francis gave me the sensation of settling down to the bottom of the ocean. That in itself is funny, and Scott does make a number of humorous remarks there as well. Language is persuasive as well, because we find that Atticus is at the trial, and he has to persuade the jury. Did it work? No. So nonetheless, he says, there is not a person in this courtroom who has never told a lie, who has never done an immoral thing, and there is no man who has never looked upon a woman without desire. Now, this is a mouthful. <laughs> the use of de literary devices. Now, let's get straight on to in, in it. There is irony, similes, metaphors, allusions, imagery, foreshadowing, and hyperbole getting in there. And we're almost done, so please stick around. Irony is there. A good example is when Miss Caroline, the teacher, tells Scott to stop reading at home. It is ironic. You'd think you'd want a child to read, but you tell her not to read at home. Also, when Miss Gates speaks out about Hitler's negatively for his actions as a dictator to Germany, yet she is strongly prejudiced against African Americans. There is simile and there is a metaphor. The fascination of Boo Radley's place is captured in a revelation by Dill. It drew him to the moon water. Sorry, it drew, as it draws the moon to the water. Also, Scott shows her passion for the summer holidays by saying summer was our best season. It was sleeping on the back screen porch in cots of trying to sleep in the tree houses. Summer was everything good to eat. It was a thousand colors in a parched landscape. There is illusion. There is a reference to the North and South and Civil War in the text, which forms a part of the American history. So there you would have had historical illusion. There is imagery. The imagery is haunting in many ways. For example, there is the fire. There is the lynch mob. We have gotten the description of Boo Radley. We see the mad dog. We see the use of guns. We see the use of knives. All of these visual imagery adds to the effect of the novel. There is foreshadowing. At the start of the novel, the readers see that the UL's, the UL's started it all. And the rest of the story goes on to explain how it is that the UL's started it all. Hyperbole is another one. Scott describes the tone of Macomb to emphasize, to emphasize the lifelessness that existed there. She says, Scott says, people move slowly then. A day that was actually 24 hours seemed longer. There was no hurry, for there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy and no money to buy it with, nothing to see outside the boundaries of Macomb County. And we're almost done, people. Thank you. You're, you're doing very well if you stuck around. Thank you. And finally, we get into conflict. 
conflict between individuals, conflict between social groups, conflict within the individual, and uh, conflict between gender. And we are almost done. You stuck around. I appreciate that. The conflict between individuals. Oh, and don't you worry. There will be a separate video. If you just want to know about conflicts, there will be a separate video on the conflict in the story. For sure. Conflict between individuals. The individuals included Scout, Atticus, and Jem. That's a conflict between, there is a conflict between Scout and Walter Cunningham. There was one between Cousin Francis and Cecil Jacobs. There is one between Mrs. Dubois and Jem. There is Scout and Miss Caroline. There is Miss Caroline and Boris Ewell. There is Scout and Uncle Jack, Bobby Ewell and Tom Robinson, Boo Radley and his father, Bobby Ewell and Atticus. Bob Ewell and Jim and Scout. Wow, that's a lot of conflict between individuals. There is also conflict between different social groups. The opposing groups are the Caucasians, the whites, and the African Americans. There is conflict between the middle class of Maycomb and the lower social class. There is conflict as well between the Ewells and the Finches, Mrs. Dubois and the Finches, the Ewells and the Robinsons, uh, Miss Maudie and the Finches, the Finches and the Society, Calpurnia's church member and scout, um, the Robinsons and the Society as well, and the Radleys and the Society. Now then there is conflict within the individual, for example, scout and the, her dilemmas, for sure, and she has a lot of them. She experiences a lot of conflict growing up, and she experiences the world. And these are conflicting to her because much of it, as a child, she's in a sense, she does not understand what it means to survive in the adult world. Then there is gender conflict, and this is shown through Aunt Alexandra and Scout's relationship. Now, thank you so much for watching. It's a pleasure having you here. If you want to see more on the conflict that existed in the novel, please keep your bell notification on if you want to see about the symbols, if you want to see about... Um, what was it again? Something else. But keep your bell notifications on for sure. And you will see other videos being uploaded relating to To Kill a Mockingbird. Thank you so much for staying here for this 42 minutes plus. I try to go as fast as I can and I knew it was very long. But I will break down as many of them as I can into shorter videos. So, but stay tuned for more videos. Thank you so much for watching.